Welcome, everyone. Thank you for showing up early in the morning, day two. Uh, you're in GRC 302, managing risk in the regulated environment. And we have uh, Japan's digital agency presenting with us today, sharing their story. We'll do some introductions here in a second. This is our agenda. So we're going to do some introductions. Um, these folks will go off stage, and I will talk about managing risk in regulated environments after which digital agency Omega Sun will come up and talk about the digital agency story. He'll introduce you to what digital, digital agency is in Japan. Uh, after that, I will come back up on stage and talk about managing risk, specifically with AWS services. At that point, Yamamoto Sun will come up from digital agency and do a deeper dive into how their, uh, what their AWS cloud journey looks like. And then we'll wrap the session up. So just a quick introduction on the AWS side. Uh, I have been at AWS close to seven years this October. I have over 15 years experience using AWS. I'm a former CTO of a SaaS company uh, that focuses on sports and uh, entertainment. And my role at Amazon is to run an internal community of about 1,300 people as of today that have a passion for cloud operations. So that includes governance, compliance, observability, cloud financial management. The tone base on Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Takahiko Otombe uh, from Japan, and currently leading the government business at AWS Japan. I joined AWS 10 years ago, 2013, and built AWS Japan public sector. Over the past decade, AWS has expanded significantly in Japan with many customers, including government, education, healthcare, and non-profit organization. All right, to and Omega-san, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, I'm Akihiro Umegai. I'm working for Japanese government digital agency as an executive advisor right now. And I lead a, a comprehensive formation of Japanese government cloud strategy past years. So we today uh, talk about uh, that strategies and architectures and some risk controls. Thank you. And then Yamamoto-san. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Norohito Yamamoto, senior expert in digital agency. I have 10 years' experiences of cloud computing, and I launched AWS Japan Professional Services 10 years ago, and now I'm leading the government cloud team in digital agency. All right, thanks, guys. So they'll come back up on stage here in a bit, but I'll take this first section. So let's talk about managing risk in a regular environment. And you know, Japan's digital agency, which you'll learn more about in this session, is obviously an example of government, right? This is a very big regulated environment. But we also have healthcare, financial services, as well as telecoms and energy. So all these environments pre pre or they present unique challenges because you operate in this regulated environment. You have regulatory and compliance programs that you have to adhere to. And the digital agency will talk a bit about how they um, worked within the, those constraints uh, within Japan and the services that they used uh, to, to meet their, or to solve their challenges. And when you use AWS, we take care of the security of the cloud. You're responsible t for taking care of the security inside the cloud. And so you inherit, just by leveraging AWS, by using AWS to deploy your workloads, you're inheriting a lot of global security and compliance controls automatically just by using the AWS cloud. And like I said, that shared responsibility model where you handle the security in the cloud, we don't just leave you to take care of that. We also provide you with a lot of rich services. And we're going to talk about some of these today. Uh, and digital agency will we'll dive deeper into several of these. But we have a, a wide breadth of services across these five categories, Ident identity and access management, detective controls, which we'll, we'll dive deeper into later, infrastructure protection, data protection, and incident response. And you probably have noticed throughout uh, the event here at Reinforce, many of our tracks and our sessions fall under these five categories. So how do we actually manage risk? I'm going to present you with one way you can do this, um, something I think I've seen being quite successful. I present you with a, a chart. This is a typical Amazon chart. We don't have any measurements on the left or X or Y axis. But on the Y axis, we have the risk of change. And on the x-axis, we have confidentiality. So all, not all workloads are the same. When you're bringing workloads, migrating them to AWS, or building native new workloads in AWS, not all workloads carry the same amount of risk. So it's really important that you classify those workloads. 
and so you can tie them to the appropriate controls to manage that risk. And so this is one way I've seen customers do this. They plot their workloads. Again, I'm not gonna give you a formulaic uh, mechanism to do this, but the idea here is identify your workloads, classify them based off the impact. So what do I mean by this? Well, the workloads at the top right, these are probably gonna be your higher impact workloads. These are likely gonna be managed by a centralized operations team. Um, and they're gonna be more, they will have more security controls applied to them, right? These workloads have a huge risk to change and they contain a lot of confidential data. Whereas workloads on the bottom left, more likely are gonna be your dev test workloads, your engineering sandbox accounts. They're gonna have some basic security controls, but they're not gonna have the same level of security controls that these higher impact workloads have. And just to make this like a bit more real, let's walk through some fictitious examples. These are examples I came up with that, uh, that will plot basically on this graph. So let's talk about dev server first. Like where would a dev server, development server, land on here? Probably in the bottom left, right? There's not a lot of risk to change as a development server. Maybe there's some confidential data a little bit, I guess the source code, but nothing hugely confidential. So our dev server probably is down here. Well, what about like an internal wiki? There's almost no risk to change on the wiki. That's the whole point of a wiki. You have versioning, you can roll back. But from my experience, there's usually a lot of confidential data there. So we might plot this over here on the right. Now, what about CICD pipeline? Again, be on source control, source code. It probably doesn't have that much confidential data, but there's a huge risk to change if your pipeline breaks. You can't deploy, you can't roll back. So again, these are just examples. I'm not giving you a formula on how to actually map this, but just this is a mental model, mental exercise. So what would go in the top right? I tried to think about the most consequential workload imaginable, and I think it's probably payroll application. We all want to get paid. Right? This goes down, your employees don't get paid. This is a really bad situation. There's also a lot of confidential data in this type of system. So the point here, the point I'm trying to make is not all workloads are the same. So you need to apply the appropriate controls for the type of workload based off its impact. This is another thing I see a lot of customers struggle with is they often will try and build their controls to the lowest common denominator. You want to think of controls as layers. You can, it's like baking a cake, basically. You build your controls and add layer upon layer upon layer. So there's probably be some controls out there that are going to be applicable to any workload. Your dev test workload, your payroll application, your wiki, it doesn't matter. You're gonna have a base level of controls. This is the lowest common denominator. But as you identify those workloads that carry more risk, they will, not, they will need additional controls applied to them. And so think of controls as this additive thing um, that you can apply to your workloads, not building simply to the lowest common denominator. And so here would be some examples you know, that we might that we often see customers apply to all environments. For example, in terms of managing confidentiality, making sure that you don't have any static credentials, um, generally setting up a um, SAML authentication, having standardized roles. Uh, in terms of managing risk, the risk of change here, really clearly defining account ownership and accountability. Who's spinning up these accounts? Who's running these workloads? Internally, I given a lot of uh, permission to go spin up AWS accounts if I want. But the one thing I have to do when I do that, I have to define ownership. I have to define, I'm the owner of this account, my manager is gonna be the financial owner, and so we have very clear ownership on accounts internally, and we see a lot of customers do this, right? So this is really important, regardless of environment. Now for a medium risk environment, maybe as opposed to having broader roles, where you give folks a lot of privilege. Again, that's what you typically expect in like a dev test environment. Now we're deploying finer grained roles, right? We're probably gonna collect additional observability data, platform logs, other types of logging. We're gonna have, um, we may constrain some of the configuration that folks can do in these accounts. And some of the ways we also, in these medium risk environments that we, we manage the risk of change, we're gonna limit individuals, um, limit the changes that individuals can make we're gonna increase the availability and we're gonna to start to increase automation and, and, and adopt in automation. And digital agency will talk a lot about that. Now in these high risk environments like our payroll application, right? And we see this a lot with these really, these workloads that carry a lot of risk. They're going to, 
in many cases, they are pre-configuring the network environment. They have almost no or limited access to the internet. They apply very fine-grained security monitoring. Um, and in many cases, and digital agency will talk about this, there's really, the human is taking out the equation and they're using, using automation everywhere. So again, these are just things that we've seen with the customers that we worked with. And the idea here, the takeaway is, think about your workloads, classify them based off the impact, and then apply those, map the appropriate security controls um, to those workloads. So my guy, son, I'll have you come up and he's gonna introduce uh, the digital agency story. So, yep, both of you. So before introduction from the digital agency, so uh, I will show the government cloud journey around the world. So it is important for government to create a cloud strategy at the nation level. The, for example, in the United States, the Obama administration created a cloud-first strategy in 2009 and started using the cloud. We can see a similar trend in UK, uh, Australia, and Singapore. So in Japan, the Japan government announced the cloud by default declaration in 2018. And this is a guideline that using a cloud computing is top priority for government information system. Subsequently, the digital agency was established, the government cloud was built, and the cloud smart basic policy was developed to using the most advanced technology. The public sector is positioned the high regulated environment. In addition, they handle a wide range of data, unclassified, confidential, security, a secret, and top secret. With these customers, the public sector has four key initiatives. First, we support the government digital strategy and the cloud policy. This is what I mentioned. Second, AWS is responding to the government cloud security guideline. In Japan, the government has started to evaluate cloud service provider security in 2021, which is called ISMAP, and AWS is currently registered. Third, the procurement is really important, and we is devising the mechanism for cloud procurement. Government traditionally have a single year and fixed budget. Now, we are challenging to break this traditional contract and to introduce pay-as-you-go model. To finally, to modernize the information system in public sector, we are providing a technical support, such as a well-architect and the best practice. So now, I will invite Umegai-san from the digital agency, and he will explain the detail. Uh, okay, uh, hello everyone. Again, I'm Akihiro Megai, working for Japanese government, digital agency. Uh, let me talk about some behind the history, uh, why Japanese government newly created digital agency, and what's the meaning, what's the background history. So, uh, it's established September 2021. And uh, Japanese spend a lot of time for IT, like uh, policy making and strategy making, but why newly this agency have been established? That's a key point. So please take as a, some fast, simple question in your head and listen my talks, please. So please focus on our commitment. There is a, some strong definition. It's actually very strong if we consider Japanese government say in public. So green color part say eliminate inefficient technology of the government. That's a strong word, really. So Japanese government say we are using inefficient system. That's the meaning. And the second one is the last paragraph, the green color one. Uh, we're going to accelerate the digitalization in a user-driven manner, which means maybe past time, the system is not user-driven manner. And we don't focus on customer benefit, which means our Japanese nation people's benefit. So 
to flip out those contexts digital agency have been established. And to go back to our Japanese government some history a little bit. So the word E dash government, I think all the people like me remember E dash blah blah is a kind of a popular word, the early 90s, I think. So even say E dash blah blah, E dash document something. So Japanese government created E dash government word and trying to make a IT policy with latest technology and spend years and years and actually the actual investment and true investment happened early 2000 and spent 20 years and made a hard effort to create really good IT strategy, but finally we failed. The situation became apparent when COVID-19 hit Japanese island. And everybody get a really tough situation after COVID-19 hit in global, including America in any, any countries. And at that time, like a, for example, um, like a, people have to shut down their business, like a restaurant to prevent infection, right? Then Japanese government would like to provide like a subsidiary aid, some, I mean, money supply and supporting people's business. It's a government responsibility. But so far, it didn't work very well by the failure of system implementation. Then uh, Mr. Hirai, the former ministry, uh, declared this is a really strong expression, uh, again, uh, digital defeat, or maybe in English, digitalization defeat. So he expressed, uh, he expressed that our practice was failed. So that's why we established digital agency and needs to reform everything to bring true benefit to nation people by leveraging IT practice. That's the kind of situation. Then uh, suddenly uh, some chance comes to our team, I mean uh, some crowd teams, which is initially actually myself and Yamamoto-san, my colleague, just two people, so started something uh, new if, uh, effort to leveraging crowd service and provide more better service for nation people. So when COVID-19 hit, uh, government needs to create vaccination status tracking system. And some um, senior bureaucrats run and visit my desk. Hey, uh, we have uh, some favor. Uh, we are having a really urgent serious situations. We have to create a vaccination tracking system. Okay, uh, we're gonna make effort. Yeah, let me know the status. Um, okay, um, we only have uh, two months until the production. What? Two months, really? And then, yeah, what types of systems? Um, we are having kind of distributed system over 1,700 local government. We have to gather those people's personal healthcare information and check like uh, these people vaccinated and record go back in a secure way in each local government system. So those people's system have to be distributed by Japanese law. We can violate. And also, we have uh, 120 million Japanese nation people. We have to deal with those huge amount of record. And the final part, I'm having a, a security and risk control expertise as well. So I know this is tough. We have to deal with PHI system regulations, personal information protection regulations. And we also have central government uh, regulations as well, and also security control requirements. We have to deal with all these constraints within two months. So I scratched my head, actually. And I, but I started some um, our existing practice together with Yamamoto-san and some startup company. We actually fully leveraged the ISC concept. So luckily, uh, we have some preparation with Yamamoto-san 
Embedded Security Control ISC baseline by AWS CDK. And we, so far, somehow, maybe half of required security control have been implemented at the time. Like Gregson said, not a traditional security controls, but modern security control by leveraging AWS services. So I actually, and Yamos and myself, actually could implement those baseline system within one week. Then hand over baseline system to startup, and we actually created two pipelines. One is application source code pipeline, which is truly the free managed by startups who is having a PHI record tracking systems. And we uh, start to manage uh, ISC code base, which maybe, um, not maybe, actually, uh, reduce uh, tons of burden from those startup application focused company to focus on infrastructure risk control, which means that we implemented risk control of infrastructure instead of startup company. So there are two code pipelines. Then it does get some success, and we could release those vaccination tracking system within two months. And so far, after the on production, we have seen we have seen no any major failure so far, past two years. So let me get into uh, more details of Japanese government cloud concept. Um, after this uh, vaccination tracking system success, so I got some order, like uh, make more comprehensive uh, cloud strategy to support those 1,700 local system as well as uh, 13 central agencies' load systems. So what is the kind of measurement axis? Uh, any kind of logic or measurement axis does work, it's up to you. This is one of the example. So I just think about uh, security and risk controls high and low, and scale of deployment. And one more measure is abstract and automation. And actually, we would like to speed up release application in a secure way. Then I think a green line could be like this. So scalability high and even security high, then automation level must be high. Then we can consider what types of cloud architecture could be mapped on this uh, measurement axis. So, I think uh, right upper side, uh, saying uh, ISC and uh, the managed services, we actually fully managed, uh, fully leveraging managed service and ISC. So we can do more in advance security risk control. I mean, embed those control into code and already implement minimum requirement into the code and provide those foundation to many agencies and local government. So they don't uh, need to too much care about infrastructure risk control. That's the kind of strategy. Then we uh, do these evaluations. Then we created this kind of uh, concept of Japanese government strategies. The green color part is some important part. Rapid, flexible, secure, and highly cost-effective way. So we provide this kind of cloud system, but not only AWS, with as a multiple cloud service provider. So that's why IEC is mandatory for us to achieve this objective. And this is a newly published program and guideline after we studied government cloud. There are three major parts. One is the upper, most upper part, white color one. Is focus on the benefit of nation people, and which leads to a, a benefit of application development teams. So we're gonna reduce their burden, let them free leverage latest of technology, while uh, reduce uh, some consciousness of too much security control. Then we can do this. No, so we don't want to that status. So we take more responsibility in infrastructure area. Then middle part, instead of reducing their burden, we 
take our more burdens. So we uh, start to program those risk control by leveraging AWS CDK. Then we identify the minimum common required risk control into the code, and we program it and maintain it and provide it. So they can start application development from secure environment. That's our strategy. And the final part, most lower part, is also important. Government has responsibility to oversight uh, like uh, any kind of service provider. Uh, or as a means, uh, we have to have control over technology in general. So which means we have to have some um, a tight contract with cloud service providers, uh, what they provide, what they are doing instead of us in data center security like that, we have to oversight this. And it, those concepts could be mapped to these kind of layers. So white color one, it's actually focused on application development. And the middle one is actually Japanese government cloud. It's actually um, just an ISC-based source code and the maintenance team. And to hosting those many, many systems, actually our team consists almost 15 people, engineers. Uh, but coding those secure way and provide those secure environment to many nations, people, so they can do more faster secure application development. And also, also most lower part is cloud service provider. We are checking contract and those status. So this is a little bit more technology side mapping, but same concept. So that's a Japanese government cloud. So we made those secure environments. That's why we are now focusing on propagating those our practice and let like a startup know our practice so they can jump into government system. They can build a more secure application faster way with confidence. That's our uh, strategies. And also we are seeing some challenges, but this challenge is not like an issue. So we continue to refine our environment. That's why challenge coming up anyway, or newly anyway pop up. But we are working with AWS and uh, we overcome those challenges. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, oh, I need the clicker. So yeah, there's, your tagline is what? Government as a startup, I think is what you have, right? Digital agency, they call it government as a startup. So let's talk a bit, and Yamamoto's son's gonna come up here and talk about what I'm, I'm gonna talk about how you manage risk with AWS services, and he will actually talk about how they leveraged AWS services in the Japanese government to build these systems. So let's talk about where do we start? What's a good place to start? There's a few places you can start uh, when we think about managing risk, but I think, and digital agency will, will share this, but I think Control Tower is a really good place. Um, Control Tower helps you set up and govern a secure, multi-account AWS environment. It also helps you automate the creation of accounts and provides you with built-in governance, and it has capabilities and integrations into things like Security Hub to help you enforce best practices, standards, and reg regulatory requirements with some prefigured controls. Uh, and you know, Control Tower by itself, I guess technically doesn't do much, um, but it's that really important because it orchestrates so many services. It can orchestrate infrastructure as code, which we just talked about. It will orchestrate the configuration of controls, both detective and preventative controls. It helps you enable CloudTrail across your organization. It obviously manages organizational OUs and accounts. Um, and integrates into service catalog and other services. So C Control Tower helps you build that foundation in the cloud, and it helps to orchestrate all these other services. So I'm gonna talk about three things specifically that Control Tower does to help you manage risk, and then digital agency will come up and finish up the session here and talk about these things within the context of the Japanese government. So the first is planning your landing zone. Right, this is really, really important. And again, this is a security conference. I'm sure you guys are well aware, or hopefully most of you are well aware of the boundaries around AWS accounts and OUs. 
So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, just to re but I do want to restate, like, these are fundamental to planning your landings on. These are key concepts. And the reason you would use those concepts, and specifically AWS accounts, is you that is the strongest boundary, um, isolation boundary that you can have within AWS. These are just some of the reasons why folks organize or build multi-account architectures. Some f folks will split things up, uh, the multiple accounts for security control purposes, for billing, for teams. We have a white paper on, on this very topic here. So I'm not gonna go into detail here, but these are just some of the reasons we see customers develop a multi-account strategy. And when you use Control Tower, you start with a, a base level of OUs and accounts, right? So you have your management account, and we'll spin up two OUs, two foundational OUs, and you'll spin up some accounts. That's not where you should stop. There's a lot more you can do, and there's a QR code to a white paper that we developed years ago, and we update very regularly, but this is our multi-account architecture white paper. And there is a lot of prescriptive guidance in the types of OUs you should implement after you've established your foundation with Control Tower. Now, my recommendation to you, don't go read that white paper and implement every single OU. You don't need to figure this out on day one, but start with Control Tower, start to build that foundation, use the white paper, and implement what makes sense based off what you read in that white paper. So the second really important piece when we think about how we can use Control Tower to manage risk is automate. And Digital Agency talked about this, and they'll talk about this again in a few minutes, but automation is key, um, especially you want to remove the human from the equation. So Control Tower has several capabilities to help you customize infrastructure as code, basically, in your workloads. And there's different reasons why people need to customize things, right? Control Tower will spin up an account, but often you need to do more. You need to customize that. So these are the top five categories we've typically seen when we talk to customers. And we, you know, I have talked to hundreds of customers over the last few years uh, around these concepts. But very often identity, some sort of integration into an IDP, um, Ping, Okta, uh, or even our own identity center. Security and compliance. Right? So you want to spin up an account, and then maybe you want to make sure guard duty is running, or Macy, if you have sensitive data uh, in, in those workloads. Networking is pretty key, especially for those high-risk production applications where you want to pre-configure the network. You want to make sure there's no access to the internet. So very, very often we see a lot of customers wanting to, to do customizations of their network after they spin up that account into their landing zone. We also have logging. Right, so Control Tower will enable cloud trail um, logs for the management events or the control plane, but very often folks will want to also turn on additional logging to capture the activity in the data plane of our services or turn on VPC flow logs. And then last but not least, and what we talked about earlier is just controls. So using uh, Control Tower and its customizations to spin up uh, controls within these accounts, controls that are appropriate for the risk that that workload carries. So how do you do this? How do you customize accounts? Really simply, you can do this yourself without any other service. We vend uh, an event. So when you spin up an account, there's an event that Control Tower creates. You can capture that in Event Bridge, and you can kick off a completely customized workflow if you want through step functions or what other system uh, you might want to build. But we provide you with options. So if you pr we have both options for CloudFormation as well as Terraform. And from a CloudFormation perspective, we have a service-managed solution that we launched a little over a year ago, and then we have a solution-based approach. And I'll talk about these very briefly. But AFC, or Account Factory Customization, this is managed. It's a service-managed solution. Um, and it basically uses service catalog to baseline an account. So if you can define your infrastructure's code in CloudFormation, you upload that to service catalog. And when you tell Control Tower to go create an account, or you can update an account, it will establish that baseline for that account. And this is just an example, a screenshot of like what this actually looks like. Um, so you can delegate these baselines to like a shared service account, give the appropriate permissions, and then from your management account, you can um, basically execute the baseline against your accounts. Like I said, we also, and again, this kind of confuses folks, so that's why I'm going through all these different options. Uh, we also have CFCT, customizations for AWS Control Tower. Now, this is solution-based. Uh, it uses code pipeline, and it supports deploying CloudFormation stack sets, as well as SCPs, and we store all the configuration in S3. 
I'm not going to go through this whole architecture diagram, but just to highlight how this all works. There's a bunch of other services here, and you can really customize this to fit your needs. Um, and then we have AFT, so Account Factory for Terraform. So very similar to CFCT, this is solution, a solution-based approach, but it uses Terraform. So it allows you, again, it uses code pipeline workflow to deploy your Terraform configurations. It also supports deploying SCPs, and the customization, customizations are also stored in S3. Uh, this is the architecture diagram here, and I would point out one key difference. The difference with AFT is you do not have to run this in a management account. You can create your own management account to run AFT um, in, in AWS. And we also did just launched support for Terraform for AFC, which, as I mentioned, is our service managed solution. So this actually got launched last week, and now you can actually deploy Terraform configurations through Service Catalog. So if you don't want to run the solution-based approach, you don't need to have an extensible solution. You simply want to deploy a baseline with Terraform. You can now actually do that with AFC. And so we have, again, our two solution-based approaches, CloudFormation and Terraform. And with this launch last week, you can now do CloudFormation or Terraform within the service managed option. And I'll put this up here so you can take a picture. This kind of takes those four approaches and then maps them to a table. Um, so this will really help you, ident or you can use this to basically identify which path you should take. My recommendation is use, a use AFC um, to start. It's simpler, it's faster to get started on, it's service managed. If you need to build a more extensible uh, configuration, as code pipeline, then consider the other solutions. And then let's talk about forcing standards through controls. This is the other thing that Control Tower can help you do to manage risk. So as I mentioned before, controls are not something you, you should develop as the lowest common denominator. You should identify and uh, classify your workloads and then map the appropriate controls to those workloads. So Control Tower, in conjunction with Security Hub, will also help give you a, a rich library of controls. And there's three types of controls you'll find in Control Tower. Preventative controls, and these are basically SCPs. Detective controls, which are AWS config rules. And then proactive controls, which are CloudFormation hooks. So if you're using CloudFormation, you can use a proactive control um, to prevent something from being deployed that's not going to be compliant. But Control Tower enables the, um, gives you a rich library, basically, of these controls. And we give you three different types of control guidance. So there's mandatory controls. Now those are mandatory because they are needed for Control Tower to function, and so you can't break Control Tower. So we want to make sure that certain things are enabled, like CloudTrail, and that you can't turn that off. And then we have some strongly recommended controls that we really highly recommend you turn on. And then we also have a lot of elective controls as well. And so the controls library as of this week, uh, we made an update a few weeks ago, back in May, but we have 390 controls, um, which is spread across 39 services, 14 control objectives, and um, a map to three different frameworks, NIST, PCI DSS, and CIS. I'll just put some screenshots up here. So when you go to the controls library in Control Tower, you can view this from a service perspective, RDS, API Gateway, VPCs, EC2, or you can navigate this from a control objective. So I want to look at the control, controls associated with enforcing le least privilege or encrypting data at rest. And then you can also view this from a framework perspective. So what are the controls that Control Tower gives me that are aligned with the NIST framework, for example? And this is an example of me diving deeper into PCI D DSS, and you can see all the associated controls with PCI here as well. Again, the point here is Control Tower is not gonna give you every single control you need, but we're gonna give you a lot to get started and then you can build upon that with things like SCPs, config, and cloud formation hooks. So that's wrap, wrapping up my section. Yamamoto-san is gonna come up here and talk, dive a bit deeper into the digital agency story and how they used some of these services um, to build their landing zone. So Yamamoto-san. Now I'm in Norohito Yamamoto again. I will describe in more details how we came up with multi-account strategy and how we planned the landing zone and automated account management in the Japanese government cloud. Actually, two years ago, when we started considering the Japanese government cloud, there were five challenges in front of us. 
I think these five challenges are common in the public sector. The first is data governance. And the second is scale, scalability to support the large number of systems. Third is budget, how to align the budget process with the pay-as-you-go pay pricing model of cloud computing. And fourth, traditional security. The government officers and the staffs are bound by the traditional securities, so we have to break with them. The finally, the fifth, legacy architecture. We have to change legacy architecture to modernize one, modernize the architecture. There are these five challenges in front of us two years ago, and I will explain how, to we, how we solve these five challenges below. The first one is data governance. The first thing we have done for the data governance is restricting data from stored, uh, uh, restricting data from stored outside domestic regions, Japanese regions. So we restrict the region, only Tokyo and Osaka. And the second one, second thing is we clarify the ownership of data. We define the conditions to become the owner of AWS accounts. For example, only, only, the, job, only the government offices uh, who is responsible for that system or the government agencies entrusted by that offices. Though they are, only, they cannot, only they can be assigned to the owner of AWS account. So we can clarify the ownership of the data in that AWS account. Of course, we are using the cryptography and the AWS Nitro engine to, to ensure pro data protection. Now, in some critical cases, we will use confidential computing and BYOK, I think. Uh, th those are the, uh, the, the technical side of the data governance, I think. The, uh, uh, the, the limitation of region and data protection by using cryptography and the Nitro engine and to clarify the ownership of AWS accounts like that. And the second is the scalability. As you know, uh, we have lots of tons of users in Japan. We have certain, certain agencies in central government. Uh, and also we have 1,741 local governments. And also we have a Koshi public, uh, Koshi public area entities. So we have lots of users in the government cloud. And we have to prepare the cloud computing environment to run these large number of systems. The first thing we have, we have considered is, of course, multi-account strategy. Uh, the, the, uh, we uh, we define the, to create one AWS account for each, uh, each system environment. One AWS account for each system environment. For example, one AWS account for production environment and another AWS account for test environment like that. And these environments, these AWS accounts are automatically provisioned by the control tower. And these, if we have such kind of AWS accounts for each system environment, we can clarify the ownership of AWS accounts. And also, we can assure the independencies of AWS account and that system information. And the users, uh, after, creation, after the account creations, users will use the service catalog to configure the mandatory settings. And also users can use sample IAC in template, infrastructure as, con infrastructure as code template that we provide. Those, by using those IAC template, the users effectively de develop their own systems, I think. This is an example of IAC template. This is written in CDK code. And this defines, this code defines the, the typical system configuration patterns like combination of ECS, Fargate, and RDS, et cetera. 
those IAC templates we provide to users, the users can use these, these sample IAC templates to develop their own system. As for organization's designs in, my, in our multi-account strategy, uh, OUs are, we are prepare OUs for each SCP patterns, security control policy patterns, uh, instead of the real organization. Uh, so for example, uh, we have uh, OUs for the SCP pattern of production environment and we have all use uh, for the SCP pattern or of te test environment like that. Now, if we prepare the all use aligned to real organization, organizations, I think it might be easy to understand for human beings, but I think it must have made complicated management of uh, SCPs and accounts. Imagine, uh, to, to deploy the same SGP to many OUs aligned to the real organizations. I think that, that, that kind of management of SGP is uh, kind of nightmare, uh, terrible, I think. So we define the OUs for SGP patterns of each production environment or test environments like that instead of the real organization. And the, these accounts we explained in the multi account strategy, those are secured by so called guardrail. As a guardrail, we have a few preventive controls like restriction, region restriction, etc. And we have many detective controls provided by the security hub, control tower, and config. Compared to the guardrails, the gatekeeper's mode security model, which needs the central single point to permit to use, or, uh, the, 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 which needs the approval for everything. That kind of security model is not, cannot be scaled in such kind of large amount of systems environment. So I think that guardrails security model is very important in such kind of large system environment. And the third thing, the budget. Uh, in, the, I will, in, the, in this deck, I will explain the technical side of the budgets. And the cloud usage fees are paid in monthly right now, like, just like electricity and gas in Japan, in Japanese digital, in Japanese government cloud. And the payment is in Japanese yen. We define the organizations to have different payer accounts for, pay, for different payment entities or for different payment methods. For example, we have a payer accounts for central government or another payer accounts for local government and another payer account for Koshi public sectors or something like that. Because uh, we have to separate the bills and the invoices according to the source of the budget. So we have to separate the payer account according to the source of the budget. So we have now the multi-payer accounts in the AWS. And it's also important to visualize the week monthly cost data because in general, in the public sector, as you know, as long as it does not exceed the budget amount, the government officers and staffs don't care the payment amount. They don't care the cost reduction if the payment is under the budget. So we have to guide them to encourage their mind, to change their mind to lower cost. So, uh, to do, to do such a thing, to do such a guide based on the data, we have to gather and, mon we have to gather and visualize the cost of data every month. And to do that, uh, we can advise them to change their mind to lower cost based on the data. So cost visualiz visualiz visualization is very important, I think. 
both the traditional security. The, actually, as I said, the, got the government officers and the staff are bound by the security, traditional security thinkings. For example, they tend to implement many security softwares and many security rules in their environment without any considerations or without any risk analysis. I think there is two reasons why they think they have to implement such, such many security softwares. I think the first one is they have many operating access routes. And the second is the operating system and the middlewares have many vulnerabilities. For the first one, uh, we want to propose the zero-touch production concept. In the, in the zero-touch production environment, the users, the, the, the operators doesn't, uh, doesn't touch the um, test production environment uh, only with the CICD code, uh, CICD pipeline. They can update and maintain the infrastructure only via CICD pipeline by using IEC. I think. So in such kind of zero-touch production environment, they cannot modify the infrastructure by hand. So the CICD pipeline automation is the only method to maintain the infrastructure. So there are, there are no operating access roads where the malicious code can get in. I think such kind of zero-touch production is very, uh, raised the security level very high. In, and in such an environment, the management console is used by read-only, I think. The second issue, uh, second reasons, the operating system and the middlewares have many vulnerabilities. So when using, when we use the, uh, the cloud-optimized architecture consists entirely uh, of managed services, and also infrastructure is maintained by infrastructure as called IAC, there is no operating systems in such an environment, and there is no, main, no middlewares in such an environment, I think. If we achieve such kind of environment, uh, there are, uh, we don't need the antivirus servers, patch management servers, and bastion servers, etc. So it, it affects, um, it, it's very effective for the cost and the security, I think. And, uh, Yes, in, in the, in the no operating systems and middlewares, I think it raises the level, security levels, levels very, fine, very high instead of the, the implementation of the security software, I think. And, the, and the, the, of course, the daily monitoring of security is very important, I think. I think one shot penetration test, it, it's important, but one shot penetration test is not enough, I think. The daily security monitoring is more important, I think. And the continuous security monitoring, monitoring the alert of guard duty and security hub, that leads us to notice an unintended configuration of the systems and to, to lead us to take actions to them. So this kind of operating and monitoring is very important to raise the security level, I think. And finally, the fifth, the legacy architecture. We have three things, we have done three things. The first is release the basic policy. Second is uh, the small achievements, small success. The third thing is to define the, the realistic migration steps. Actually, at first, uh, we released the basic policy for the Cloud Smart last year. It's an official document for the government, government entities. And it guides the cloud optimized, cloud native architecture whenever they use the government cloud. And simple migration and virtual machine migration is prohibit, basically prohibited. So the, the government officers and the staff have to read this basic policy and they have to obey this policy. So now they are considering how do they can achieve the modernizations of applications or cloud-native architecture. 
And the second is the small achievement, small success. As Umegai san said, we are running one of COVID vaccination system in the government cloud. We are now running this system for two years, and this system is uh, this system architecture is modern and cloud native that we have architected, and it has never been done, and uh, it is running very at very low cost. So, this kind of small success, small achievement proves uh, the effectiveness of the modernization in the digital agency, I think. And then the graph in the right side, you can see the, the, the cost trend for the one year period and a percentage of service usage. As you can see the graph below, we don't use EC2, any EC2 instances. So in general, the EC2 has a large amount, large portion in the circles graph, but you can, you can see, as you can see, there is no EC2 instance portion. So it, it affects very, uh, it impacts the cost, I think. And you can see the graph above. I, we, we are lowering the cost almost every month. So such kind of crowd operating operation, I think the, the cost reduction can be possible, I think. And as I said, this small achievement can prove the, the effectiveness of crowd modernization. The third thing, uh, we define the intermediate step to modernization because uh, may, many people say uh, we cannot achieve the modernization at once. So we define the intermediate step to modernization as R1, the platform. Uh, in the R1, uh, the platform environment, uh, operating and security, RDB, such kind of things that must be configured by managed services, but application can be migrated to EC2 instances. So they cannot modify the application so much. I think this kind of realistic migration step definition can, uh, can encourage them to migrate to the government cloud. Those kind of solutions to the five challenges, besides those kind of solutions, uh, we have a web services for managing the large amount of systems and provide a set of service and auto automation to the users. Uh, we, after we develop these web services, we can manage the mapping tables between the system information and the environments, the large environments because we have multi-accounts, we have multi-payer accounts, also we have multi-cloud service providers other than AWS, so we have to have such kind of bumping tables to systems to the environment. And uh, we can prepare such kind of mapping table. Uh, uh, after that, uh, we can create a dashboard to visualize the system cost instead of the account's cost. And so I have explained the solutions to the five challenges. In summary, the data governance, uh, for data governance, we limited the regions and clarified the ownership of data. For scale, we implemented multi-account strategy and guard rates by using the AWS services. For budgets, we implemented the monthly payments and the cost, of, cost trend visualization to encourage them to cost, reduce the cost. The fourth traditional security, we have uh, the, the infrastructure as code and uh, zero touch production automations are efficient for the, the changing the traditional security thinking. And the legacy architecture, uh, we have achieved the small results and the modernization, release the modernization policy, it, if it can be effectively uh, uh, impact on the digital agency, I think. And the Japanese government cloud initiative has just begun. We are continuing to develop the government cloud to contribute the digitalization in the Japanese government. Thank you. Right. Let's wrap this up. So just in summary on the session around managing risk in regular environments, number one, Classify your risk by impact. Digital agency talked about how they did that. 
the more risky workloads, they use more and more automation. They remove the human out of the equation. Number two, start with Control Tower. It's a really good way to get your landing zone foundation set up quickly and securely and provide a base level of governance. Number three, which Digital Agency talked about a lot, is automate, automate, automate. You can try and automate everything possible. That's one of the best things you can do to help manage risk when you run your workloads. And then the last piece that we talked about is use detective controls. Digital Agency talked about how they use CDK to deploy configuration roles, config roles. Use your detective controls to actually validate that your preventative and your proactive controls are working. And with that, I want to thank you guys for coming to our session. We're happy to take questions out in the hallway. Please complete the session survey. We're a dad-driven company. We love your survey responses. Thank you so much.